Welcome back, everyone. This is officially the halfway point in our Book of Mormon study. We're at week 26 in Our Mothers Knew It. This week, we get to finish the story of the city of Ammonihah. Thankfully, Alma and Amulek are going to go beyond this week's study, and we'll get to study a lot more of their words. But the actual city of Ammonihah ends this week. And it's particularly interesting because the theme of this week's study is all about entering into his rest. And I found myself wondering, of all the verses, why did they pick that one for this week's study? Because you see a lot of unrest this week. You see a city turn against prophets. You see a prophet and his companion thrown into jail. Their whole life is stripped away from them, their freedom, their dignity. You see all kinds of hard circumstances. You see women and children who are believers in the gospel that Alma is preaching be thrown into a fire. Like This is not a restful week of study, but that's the theme because this undercurrent that weaves through all of it is all about his rest, finding the kind of rest that comes without consideration of circumstances. And there's something so cool about it. In fact, what it reminded me of is every time I've trained for a race. So I've done one marathon and a bunch of half marathons and a few other races over the course of my years. And every time I get into this zone, right, where I'm, I've done the training plan, I'm about midway through, maybe three quarters of the way through, and I've seen the change in my own body. I can tell my muscles are stronger so that when I get into those long runs, I'm unafraid. Distances that used to feel so big and ominous to me all of a sudden seem doable because I did something really similar the weekend before and I just have to stretch it one more mile. And then usually by the time I get to race day, there is a sense of rest. Not that I think the race is going to be easy. In fact, I always know it's going to be taxing and that it's going to take every ounce of me. But I always feel like there's this rest where I know I've done everything I can in my training program. I've strengthened my muscles as much as I should in order to be ready for this race. And so there's this sense of rest feeling like no matter what happens, I can do this. And that's the kind of rest I feel like Alma teaches about this week. He's going to teach about how you find it through diligence and not through circumstances how you find it through faith in Christ and not from the circumstances of the people around you or what happens to you next, how you stay grounded in things. A big part of it will be about finding this kind of rest through priesthood connections. A whole chapter that we studied this week is focused on the priesthood and how it can give you this ability to find rest, to access his rest in an eternal way and in the short-term way. So we've got all kinds of touch points about how to access rest, thanks to Alma's writings. It really reminded me of President Nelson. This is from his October 2022 talk. He said this, The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. I think this is what you're going to see in this week of study. Alma and Amulek and even others find this sweet spot of rest. Despite all the swirling circumstances around them, they find rest. And I think by studying their words, we can find it too. I think this leg of their race is a harrowing one, but they can do it and they know they can do it. And therefore they proceed. They've, they've got this peaceable rest and it's something we can pull from. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. Okay, just like we've done in the past, I'm going to give you nine good ideas throughout this week's study, and I'm going to teach them in three different ways. First, I'm going to give you three sparks. These are themes that I saw between the verses and between the chapters, you know, common threads that, I, that just kept popping up to the surface for me as I was studying. Next, I'm going to give you three good questions. These are, I'm hoping, will just inspire good conversations with the people around you and get you into your scriptures to find some answers. And then we'll do a second video of three object lessons so that you can study even more in these chapters and hopefully relay some of those teachings to the people around you. This is where I give you tools and creative ideas so that you can find some new, fresh ways to teach these beautiful doctrines that you're going to find in this week's study. But since I can't teach you everything there is to find in these chapters, mostly because I don't even know everything there is to find, I think my whole lifetime could be spent digging through these chapters and I wouldn't get to the bottom of it. 
but I wanted to give you at least an understanding of what you're going to cover this week. So let me summarize for you what's going to happen in these four chapters of study. So we're going to kick things off in Alma 13. This is that priesthood chapter that I was telling you about. This is where you hear Alma come to this very wicked city and teach all about the priesthood of God, what it offers. I think his big message is about how the priesthood can change hearts. It's designed to give men a way to change and become as Christ is. That's the whole purpose behind it. So he'll teach you a little bit about that. He'll teach you about ordinances and these holy men who were foreordained to come to this earth and teach this message of joy. It's also where you're going to find him invite you to find rest because that's the ultimate goal of all of these priesthood ordinances that you'll come to find that rest that comes as you become as he is. So he'll teach a lot about that in 13. In 14, you learn that some people believe and a lot of people don't. Those who believe end up getting persecuted. In fact, they will get up, they will get executed. Some of the men are stoned, others are chased out of the city. The women and children who believe are thrown into a fire, and Alma and Amulek are cast into prison. I really think this is kind of the residual effect of that teaching of Nehor, where if you really don't think there are any consequences for you, if you think everyone will be saved and you never have to face a judgment bar and you never have to face a savior who pushed you to be righteous and encouraged you to be as he is, if you think there is no judgment, then your choices about how you treat your fellow men turn ugly fast. And that's what you're gonna see in 14. You're also gonna see by the end of that chapter, that Alma and Amulek will burst out of that prison. We're going to spend a whole spark here, but it is a power-packed chapter of deep sorrow and incredible miracles. You'll see both in 14. 15 is where we start to feel some healing. After you've waded through the, the sorrows of 13, in, sorry, of 14, when you get into 15, you're going to see some softer messages. This is when Zeezrom, who used to be completely against these two mighty men of God, is sick with fever. He, his guilt is harrowing him up and he pleads for them to come. The believers ha that have still survived have gone to a land of Sidon, which is kind of a nearby, almost like a Waters of Mormon to that area of King Noah. Remember how they left the court of King Noah and they went and built the Waters of Mormon, basically? It almost seems like Sidon is a Waters of Mormon for this little group of believing Nephites. And Zeezrom is among them, and he will ask for healing. And then in this incredible moment of magnanimous forgiveness, Alma and Amulek do. They step into the shoes of the Savior and they heal Zeezrom in this beautiful exchange. And then you're going to see them establish a church. So inside him, and then it will start to spread to other areas. Things get back to equilibrium again, you know, where we were so far off course with the city of Ammonihah. All of a sudden, the church is getting established and things start to get stronger. By our last chapter in 16, this is when you're going to see what happens to those in Ammonihah. Those who decided not to follow, those who rejected the prophets, who killed the believers, you see them wiped out in one day. We don't get the full story of why they're wiped out. You're going to learn that later as we go into the Sons of Mosiah story. But essentially, the Lamanites, because they're angry that people, those people of Ammon that we're going to read about later, who leave the Lamanites and become essentially like the Nephites, they're angry about that. And they reach out to the first Nephite city they can find to destroy it. And it so happens that that city is Ammonihah. So you see the prophecy of Alma speaking about how this great city will be destroyed in one day happen in chapter 16. There is this great destruction of this city. And then you see this rebound of everybody who's left, that they start to grow and start to find peace again. And there's some thriving among the Nephites, but there's a, there's a hard hit that comes first to that particular city. So that kind of gives you an, a bird's eye view of these four chapters. Now let's go into the sparks and see what caught my eye and hopefully inspire you to see what will catch your eye as you head into these same chapters. I gotta tell you, one of the things I find remarkable about seers is that they always seem to see things with a glass half full. Alma goes into Ammonihah despite all of the hard that they've encountered with these hope-filled eyes. That's why in this spark, I call this first spark a house of order because I felt like much of what he taught, especially in this very first chapter in 13, it's all about order, but the holy order of God, meaning his, his fellowship that happens, this 
coming together in his holy priesthood in order to accomplish his holy work. That kind of order. It reminded me a little bit of what we heard from President Nelson in this last conference. First, he asked us to go back and study DNC 109. Remember the dedication of the Kirtland Temple? And then he said this, that dedicatory prayer, which was received by revelation, teaches that the temple is a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. This list of attributes is much more than a description of a temple. It's a promise about what will happen to those who serve and worship in the house of the Lord. They can expect to receive answers to prayer, personal revelation, greater faith, strength, comfort, increased knowledge, and increased power. I felt like what President Nelson was inviting us to do is to dive deeper into those phrases. What does it mean to have a house of order? I started to talk to my YSAs about this because remember I told you we've been talking all about the endowment and restoring this beautiful gift to the people and how it came about in the Red Brick Storehouse and where it is today and the progress between the two. I've just loved seeing the house of order as something different than what I saw before. In the past, when I heard the phrase a house of order, I always assumed that had something to do with like the neatness of the temple. <laughs> you know, it's it's tidy there and things are run on like a tight ship. It is a very well-organized, well-ordered place. Jason just started working at our temple. Just last Saturday was his very first shift as an ordinance worker. And so we're, I'm learning all kinds of things from him. And it was so fun to learn what he had to say about what a house of order is. And then also to kind of feather in what I learned from Alma, especially in this first chapter, because he teaches all about this kind of order, meaning an order like a brotherhood, a thing where you get to come and be a part of something and then you progress in it. That's what President Nelson was inviting us to do. He's saying, when you enter into this holy order, especially as, as men and women, as we go into the temple and we participate in these ordinances, we become part of this beautiful holy order and we have an opportunity to progress to increase our ability to receive revelation, to increase our ability to understand the things of God, and to increase our access to power. And that order of progression was fascinating to me. So listen to a little bit of what Alma had to say. This is Alma 13 verses 1 and 2. And again, my brethren, I would cite your minds forward to the time when the Lord God gave these commandments unto his children. And I would that you should remember that the Lord God ordained priests after this holy order, which after his holy order, which was after the order of his son to teach these things unto the people. And those priests were ordained after the order of his son in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to his son for redemption. The whole purpose of the priesthood is to help people access what God has lovingly offered, to do it in His way, by His authority, in His proper places, to give them real access to that ability to eventually find rest. And I felt like there were so many beautiful parallels between what we heard from President Nelson and what you read from Alma. Prophets teach you to access the temple, to access those ordinances so that you can accomplish this order, this progression in your life where you, you're you getting closer to what God wants for you. You see it a little bit more in 6. And thus being called by this holy calling and ordained unto the high priesthood of the holy order of God to teach his commandments unto the children of men that they might enter into his rest. That's the whole goal. Our Father's work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men, which means he needs to put order in place so that we can access it. This, this like stair-step approach, you know, this house of sequential order. That's the house of order that I think I want to study about this week. And I got a lot of it from Alma's words. One of the memories that came to mind as I was kind of stewing on this and teaching my YSAs about what I was learning, I started to think back just this spring, we went on a little quick trip down in the St. George area and we were going at night into the hotel pool and I had been sitting in the hot tub with Jason. Violet went and jumped in the swimming pool and there really wasn't anybody else around. And she kept trying to get me into the water, you know, to come out of the hot tub and go into the pool. But if you go from a hot tub in a St. George warm weather environment and then try to get into a pool, like it is so cold. And Violet was of course acclimated to the water. She'd been swimming around in it and she felt totally comfortable jumping in and out of the water. But for me, it was a lot harder and I get cold really easily. So I struggled to even like step into that water. It was too much of an adjustment for me to be comfortable. And I kind of think that this is what covenants are. 
I've been talking deeply about my to my YSAs about this. I'm, I'm hoping at some point to be able to articulate this better in this kind of format. But I think covenants essentially do this for us. Our baptismal covenants help us know how to acclimate our behavior. So it's closer to what God would want, right? We acclimate to our behavior to something celestial. I think temple covenants acclimate us to think differently and to feel differently. They are this elevated discipleship. And what he wants for us is to be able to step into the celestial waters and be comfortable, right? To be able to put our feet in and say, oh, this feels great. That's what he wants for you. That's rest. I think rest comes when you set your foot in that celestial kingdom of glory and you feel at home there. You feel like you belong there. And the only way for that to happen is for us to hold on to those covenants, to repent faithfully and do every can, everything we can to learn about the Savior and act the way he acts. When I started to go through my temple covenants and think through how they helped me do that, I saw so many parallels and so many connection points. I just think that's what the temple is all about. It's all about shifting our heart and our mind to follow the Lord, to take care of the people around us, to offer what is needed so that we can receive so much more. And that's what I think holy order is all about. It's all about tapping into this Melchizedek priesthood power and using it in our life. I loved how we saw in the verses that many people acclimate. This is not something that is rare, even when Alma was speaking about it. If you look in Alma 13, verse 10, and verse 10 and 11, you'll see a little bit of this. It says, Now, as I said, concerning the holy order, or this high priesthood, there were many who were ordained and became high priests of God. And it was on account of their exceeding faith and repentance and their righteousness before God, they choosing to repent and to work righteousness rather than to perish. Therefore, they were called after this holy order and were sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Similar to what we talked about a couple weeks ago about how the celestial kingdom is made up of jewels, you know, things that began in one state and were changed into something glorious. That's what he's teaching here about those who tap into that holy order, that power. They are changed. They are cleansed. They have become something new. And there's many of them. That's the part I loved the most. This, Alma is trying to teach us this isn't some rare, tiny fragment of God's children who are able to access this. There are many who have, and there are many more who will if we will just grab hold of these promises. This is what I love in 16, same chapter. Now these ordinances were given after this manner that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God, it being a type of his order, or it being his order, and this that they might look forward to him for a remission of their sins, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. Rest is when you find that sweet spot of equilibrium where you have acclimated to the temperature of heaven. I think that's why we are supposed to think celestial. It's if I can get my mind and my heart in the celestial kingdom while I live in this world, then when I have an opportunity to be with him, I'll feel comfortable. And I don't have to edge in with just my toe and then step in a little deeper. I can jump in the water. And I think that's what he wants for us. I think it's what Alma wanted for his people, even these people in Ammonihah who were so far off course. And I think it's what our prophet and apostles want for us too. This is Elder Suarez from just this last conference. He said, the house of the Lord is where we can be transformed in higher and holier ways. So when we walk out of the temple, transformed by the hope in the promises of the covenants, armed with power from on high, we take the temple with us into our homes and lives. I assure you that having the spirit of the Lord's house in us changes us completely. That's the promise. This is a house of order because it's a house where by one step at a time and one covenant at a time, we change and we become someone who is acclimated to the waters of heaven. And that will be a great feeling. This second spark I call shadow stories, because I think one of my favorite parts of studying this week with my, you know, fresh eyes perspective is I saw things I'd never seen before. One of the things that caught my eye was at the very end of Elma and Amulek's prison experience, when they finally get out of prison. Remember what happens, like the chains fall off their arms and they, the walls tumble. At least I thought the walls tumbled. And then I went into the verses and I realized the verses didn't say tumbled. The verses said that they are rent in twain. And I found myself stewing over that verse. Like why that phrasing? It seems like such an odd thing for a prison wall to do, to tear into two pieces. And then I started to realize maybe this has something to do with 
the veil. Remember how when the Savior is crucified and there is that tearing of the veil? That's the exact phrasing that they use, that it is rent in twain. It's torn from top to bottom and divided, never to be put together again, opening this beautiful portal to access God. That's what Elder Kieran talked about at conference. So once I had that in my mind, then I started to go backwards in their story and see parallels between the Savior's experiences in his mortal ministry, especially that last week of his life, and what we see in Alma and Amulek's story. I'm going to try and handle this really rever reverently, because I'm, I'm not trying to pretend that there are perfect parallels everywhere, but there were enough that I found myself appreciating their experience so much more this year than I ever have before, because I could see the Savior all over it. Let me just show you a few, but I promise there are many more. So dig into the verses and see what you can find. It's mostly in 13 and 14, but you'll see a few scattered throughout. So for example, if you start in 13, 27 and 28, you hear Alma teaching about the priesthood, right? And they express this earnest desire. This is 27 of chapter 13. And now, my brethren, I wish from the inmost part of my heart, yea, with great anxiety, even unto pain, that ye would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins and not procrastinate the day of your repentance, but that ye would humble yourselves before the Lord and call on his holy name and watch and pray continually that ye may not be tempted above that which ye can bear and thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love and all long suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that ye may be lifted up at the last day and enter into his rest. When I went back to these verses and I tried to find parallels in the Savior's story, there are actually a few of them throughout the New Testament, but the one that kind of hit me is, do you remember that scene when the Savior is looking over Jerusalem and he has that mournful tone. You know, he says, oh, Jerusalem. It almost sounds like Mormon at the end of the Book of Mormon when he's looking out over his Nephite civilization and he just aches. I feel like that's where Alma's heart is. He can see what they could be and how accessible these covenants are and how doable the commandments of God are. And he just aches even unto pain. And I loved the parallels that I saw in that beginning. It gets even deeper for me as you go into 14. So this is later when they're on the streets of Ammonihah and we find out that some people listen and follow and some reject. This is verses one and two of chapter 14. And it came to pass that after he'd made an end of speaking unto the people, many of them did believe on his words and began to repent and to search the scriptures. But the more part of them were desirous that they might destroy Alma and Amulek, for they were angry with Alma because of the plainness of his words unto Zeezrom. And they also said that Amulek had lied unto them and had reviled against their law and also against their lawyers and their judges. This to me felt really similar to what we see with the Saviors last week, especially as he's teaching in Jerusalem and around that area in that last week, you see people get angry at his truth. He cuts through their tricks and their deceptions and they get angry. In fact, you see with Alma and Amulek's story that the judges and the lawyers meet secretly. It says privily in the verses. Like they do the exact same thing that you see the leadership of, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees doing in Jesus' day where they meet secretly. Remember they like bring him in in the early hours of the morning and they take him to a place that's not a normal place for a courtroom to be held. That's the same thing you're going to see with Alma and Amulek's experience. They don't get a fair trial. They don't get anywhere close to a fair trial. And people start to testify against them. And they lie. And they say whatever needs to be said in order for them to be taken to prison. It gets even deeper. So here, this is another piece. They're later forced to watch those who are converting. I... I don't know if these are people who have made covenants and have made changes, or if it's those people that they talked about in verses one and two who just are starting to repent and just starting to get into the scriptures. Because we find out in the verses that they take the men, they cast them out, and they chase them out of the city and stone some of them. And then the women and the children, this most vulnerable population, they are taken and cast into the fire. Remember, because these people believe there are no consequences and that there is no risk to them. They're going to be saved no matter what. And so their moral compass is gone. And Alma and Amulek are forced to watch. And to me, again, I'm trying to handle this really reverently, but I really feel like this is uh, probably the hardest point. As hard as prison will be and being mocked and spit on and, you know, 
all the things that happened to Alma and Amulek, this point where they watch the suffering of believers that they taught and they helped suffer before their eyes, I just, I can't imagine what this must have felt like. And I started to look for parallels in the Savior's last week. And I think this has to be at least the closest parallel I could find was what the Savior himself in, experienced in Gethsemane. Just a piece of what he experienced when he endured all of the pains and all of the fear and all of the oppression that any victim in any time has ever felt. All of those sorrows and all of that grief, he experienced all of those things. So what Alma and Amulek are seeing for this one group of people, the Savior saw and felt for all of them. And I felt like there was this really sweet parallel between them because I think their reaction in some ways is a little similar to that weight that is on their shoulders. This is when you see Amulek, the junior companion, turn to Alma and say, we got to do something. So this is in verse 10. He says, and when Amulek saw the pains of the women and the children who were consuming in the fire, he was also pained. And he said unto Alma, how can we witness this awful scene? Therefore, let us stretch forth our hands and exercise the power of God, which is in us and save them from the flames. And Alma said unto him, the spirit constraineth me that I must not stretch forth my hand. For behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto him uh, unto himself in glory, and he thus suffer that they may do this thing, or that the people may do this thing unto them, according to the hardness of their hearts, that the judgments which he shall exercise upon them in his wrath may be just, and the blood of the innocent shall stand as a witness against them, yea, and cry mightily against them at the last day. I know this is a a fraction of a parallel, but I felt like in Amulek's words and Alma's response, both of them ache for these people. I wonder if some of Amulek's family are being thrown into the flames, or if he watched his brothers or brothers-in-law get stoned. Like you, These are his people. This is his town, and we know that his whole household converted. So you have to think this is really, really personal for Amulek. And Alma, in his meekness, says, that's not what the Lord wants us to do. And I think there is courage in both of their answers. And for me, it felt really similar to what we see from the Savior when he wants this cup to pass. In fact, he asks for this cup to pass, but then also says, not my will, but thine be done. He's almost Amulek and Alma in the same. You know, he is both of those sentiments because he feels all. In fact, he feels it's so much bigger than what we see in this little type and shadow in the Book of Mormon. But for me, it just, it brought this wave of appreciation back to my heart. As we studied it in the New Testament, I felt like all those stories came back to me as I was studying Alma and Amulek. And I just, it just gave me this deeper love for my Savior and a deeper love for these prophets and what they endured. And, and it continues. So here's another type and shadow. When they are mocked, this is Alma 14, verse 15. Behold, ye see that you have no power. This is when they've been taken and they've watched the execution of all these believers. And I can't imagine the trauma that they've been through. Now they're in prison and the chief judge, somebody who would have been under Alma when he was the chief judge of everything, right? Now this underling chief judge is taunting Alma and Amulek. And he says this, Behold, ye see that ye had not power to save those who had been cast into the fire. Neither has God saved them, because they were of thy faith. And the judge smote them again upon their cheeks and asked, What say ye for yourselves? I don't know how you hear that and not hear the jeering that we heard from the crowds when the Savior was on the cross. I just pulled out one of the verses. This is Matthew 27. This is 39 and 40. And they passed by, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. This is the same tone you're going to hear from this chief judge and all of those lawyers and judges that come into that prison day after day to mock these prophets of God. They strip them of their clothing. They try to humiliate them. They starve them. They don't give them water. They do everything they can to get these prophets to crumble. It's fascinating to me that they don't execute them. They don't cast them into the fire. One, I don't think they could because Alma testifies that their work isn't finished. And so he knows that they, even if they were pushed into the fire, they wouldn't die in it. They have a work to do. And so 
I don't know if the judges and the lawyers get a feel for that, but they're going to try to break these men. And I feel like that's what we see in the adversary over and over and over again. He wants to break believers. And I think we saw it in the Savior story too. He just never crumbles, despite all that jeering on the cross and all those who were his disciples who turned away, he stays and he stays meek and humble and does the will of our Heavenly Father. It's just this powerful parallel to me. You also see another parallel when Alma and Amulek are commanded to speak. This is fascinating to me. When you see the judges come after them and Alma and Amulek stand in kind of stoic silence, they choose to be silent. And it feels like the Savior when he's in front of Pilate and Herod and others, and he chooses silence. Not always, but when he needs to, he doesn't react. In fact, he doesn't even speak. And you feel that power in Alma and Amulek. They they channel a little bit of that meekness, and it's riveting to study. And then after many, many days of hunger and thirst and fatigue and being beaten and being spit on and jeered, there's a breaking point when things change. And I just thought this was Huge, like I, you could have sunbursts coming out of these verses for me in the in the chapter. This is around 25, 26, and 27. This is when they rise. I don't know if you guys have ever watched The Princess Bride, but you know that moment when like Wesley is has no energy and then out of nowhere when Prince Humperdinck comes, like he stands up and he tells him to drop his sword. That's how I feel when I read these verses, but times eternity, right? Like this is this is their moment when they stand. So it says in 25, it came to pass that they all went forth and smote them. These are all the judges, all the lawyers, all of them are gathered under this one prison roof in order to just try to push back this faith. And they say the same words, even until the very last, when the last had spoken unto them, the power of God was upon Alma and Amulek and they rose and they stood on their feet. Alma cries out in 26, how long shall we suffer these great afflictions, O Lord? O oh Lord, give us strength according to our faith, which is in Christ, even unto deliverance. And they broke the cords with which they were bound. And when the people saw this, they began to flee, for the fear of destruction had come upon them. They, it is finished, right? They're, they're this phase where they needed to go through this incredible hard trial is finished. And now they will rise and they stand up in the strength of God and they speak. What I love is that that's the order that happens. First, they're given the power to stand in terrible majesty. Remember when we talked about that with Joseph Smith when he's in that Richmond jail and when he rises and he like t- tells the, the like guards to be quiet, it's, they describe him as being in terrible majesty. And that's what I picture in this moment, that these frail, weak, whipped, naked men who are bound in chains stand up and they speak. And what they speak is they ask for deliverance from God. And in that moment, they're delivered. Things break away from them. In fact, this is where I saw the links between their story and the Savior story so clearly. Because the the binds, the, those bounds that held them, those chains that held them fall. Just like we see after the Savior finally finishes this incredible work for our Heavenly Father, the chains of death and hell are broken. They fall off. That veil is rent in twain, never to be connected again. Those are the same promises that are written into these verses. In 26, they break the cords. And in 27, the walls of the prison are rent in twain. I just think there are so many incredible parallels in the story. There's even more if you go deeper. Like you can see, once they're free, they don't go home. It's another thing that amazes me about the Savior that when he finally is resurrected, he he does other things, right? He goes and takes care of his people. In fact, he'll stay for 40 days and teach the apostles and get things in motion. And that's what you see with Alma and Amulek too. They don't go home just yet. Alma will eventually take him home. He'll take him back to his house in Zarahemla. But for now, they're going to establish the church. They're going to heal Zeezrom. They're going to take care of things, even though they've been through this horrific experience. All they want to do is serve and they want to serve however the Lord needs them to serve. So they'll take care of Zeezrom. They'll establish the church inside them. They'll get things moving and then they'll go home. And I just thought there were so many beautiful parallels between these touch points of their story and the incredible story of our Savior and what he offered. This is just the tip of the iceberg, you guys. I'm hoping you get into the verses and find many, many more and then share them with me because it was one of my favorite parts of this week's study.
Spark number three, I called Thou Art Not Yet as Job. Because so much of Amulek's story reminded me of Joseph Smith's experiences. And especially that part in Liberty Jail when he's pleading for understanding. Remember that those verses where he says, you know, Oh God, where art thou? And the answer he gets is, Thou art not yet as Job. And I used to read that verse almost like it's this mean trump card, right? Like Job's life is awful and it is the very worst. His friends abandon him. All kinds of hard things happen. He loses everything in his life. And to say that to Joseph, who was struggling after months in jail, almost seemed mean to me. But then the more I studied and the more I understood with you guys as we studied the Doctrine and Covenants, the more I think it's about progression, right? This idea of a house of order and becoming as God is requires these stretches of stretching. <laughs> that's what is happening. And that's what happened with Job. In order for Job to be the kind of man that he was when the Lord answered that question of Joseph's, in order to be the kind of man Job had become, Joseph needed to go through more and he needed to experience things more. In fact, the Lord was trying to cushion him by saying, your friends are still with you. There is still hope. And I think there's beauty in that answer. We don't have time to go into it now, but I did like seeing how many parallels between Amulek's story there were and what I felt Joseph must have felt. Because Amulek's kind of in a similar spot. Bless his heart, the guy loses everything. In some ways, I think he's like Job because he loses everything to be this valiant disciple of Christ. When his story begins, you know, last week when we read about Amulek, he was a pretty comfortable guy. Sounded like he had a big house and a house full of family. He had a structured business that was doing well. Like things were good for Amy. Like, and then he gets to that point when he has to decide if he's going to know or not know. And he chooses to know. And he invites Alma into his household. And for a time, things go really well, right? When Alma's just staying in his house, he talks about how his whole family is blessed and his household is blessed because the prophet of God is staying at his house and they're feeding off of his wisdom. You know, Al Amulek's people and his house are feeding off of what Alma will offer them in this beautiful guidance. And then things get hard. From that point forward, things get hard. So for example, if you look in chapter 14, you can see a few things that get stripped away from Amulek. First off, he loses his reputation in the city, right? As soon as he starts to combat against the Ezraim, he loses his popularity. I think he probably loses most of his business, if not all of it. Like he has dedicated himself to being a servant of God, and that means he has to set all of that down. So he loses those connections. He also, in that chapter, sees that believers are cast out and stoned. Like I mentioned before, I could easily see that some of these are Amulek's family members, and if the women and children in Amulek's household are in that fire, I can't imagine what that feels like. But Job can because Job experienced those kinds of losses. He also was a wealthy man who had an established friendship group and business structure and family and children, and all of that is pulled away. And then you see Amulek stripped and beaten and humiliated. I know these are different trials than Job experienced, but I think they're similar. I think when Job experiences all the issues he had with his skin and the sicknesses he felt and the abandonment and the judgment from his own friends, I think that's Amulek this week. You see his own people of his own city, his neighbors, his business associates, his friends who were in judgment seats come and spit on him and hit him over and over again in these verses. You're going to hear about them being hit, smitten on the cheek over and over again. It's this it's this condescending slap, right? It's a way to kind of put someone in their place and it happens over and over again. And again, I can't relate to that. I can't have even come close to relating to that, but Job can. And I found myself just aching for Amulek for this experience. It gets even harder for me when you get to chapter 15. This is verse 16. It says, And it came to pass that Alma and Amulek, Amulek having forsaken all of his gold and silver and his precious things, which were in the land of Ammonihah, for the word of God, he being rejected by those who were once his friends, and also by his father and his kindred. I don't know the whole story here, but sometimes I wonder if the reason his father would turn against him is if Amulek's testimony got the women of his family into that fire. If 
Amulek's testimony caused the men of his family to be stoned and chased into the wilderness. I don't know if that's what happens here or if his family actually abandons Amulek altogether. What I do know is when Amulek leaves this city eventually with Alma, he sounds like he's alone. He sounds like he goes with Alma and stays in Alma's house because he doesn't have anyone left. And I just found myself heart sick for Amulek. I mean, I just don't know how you can have so much and have so much stripped away so fast and still have the kind of faith that he has. So then I found myself wondering if he ever regretted knowing. Remember how he says that in the verse? This is if you go back to chapter 10, where he says, he was talking about how he's a man of no small reputation. Remember, he's almost like, I'm one of you guys. This is the beginning of his of his sharing his testimony. And he says, I'm a man of no small reputation among you who know me. Yea, behold, I have many kindreds and friends, and I have also acquired much riches by the hand of my industry. Nevertheless, I did harden my heart, for I was called many times, and I would not hear. Therefore, I knew concerning these things, yet I would not know. I wondered in my small-minded way, like, did he wish he had stayed in the, I didn't know, <laughs> you know, after this much loss, did he ever wonder? And then I found myself drawn to Adam and Eve's story and that incredible verse where we hear the words of Eve, who also made a choice to know, right? She and Adam made a choice to know and increase in knowledge, which then exposed them to incredible heartache. I, I can't even imagine the experience as a mother of Cain and Abel and the loss she felt and the pain she endured and all of the hard. But what she says about coming to know is glorious. It's gritty and glorious. And I loved it. So if you look in the verses, this is Moses 5. So Pearl of Great Price, verse 11. And Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. Despite how much Eve knows and has experienced all the hard, she says she is grateful, right? She is glad for the experience. She is glad to know. And as soon as that came to my mind, I thought, I don't think Almulek ever doubted. I don't think he ever said, wow, I wish I could go back to the time when I knew, but I didn't know. And then I started to comb through Amulek's experiences in these intervening chapters. And I realized how much he has. Remember, is it President Benson that talks about how, like, if you give your life over to God, he can make so much more of it than you can? So I started to look back at Amulek's story and say, okay, what did God make of his life? Every time Alma set down his riches or set down his friends or set down his connections, every time he set one of those things down, God filled him with something else. And the things he is filled with are so much greater than popularity and comfort and friends. For example, he became a man who could contend with Zeezrom on the street and speak truth clearly. He became a man who could be counted among the holy ones. He has the priesthood of God and he can use it for God's purposes. And he does. Remember people try to grab Alma and Amulek and they can't? That was in last week's study. This week, when they emerge from that prison, people talk about them as if they were lions coming out. Like he has power and it's in perfect control because he is meek, the same way the Savior was meek, but he has power at his fingertips. He is someone who uses his priesthood power to bless and forgive. It, it sounds like in that chapter when Zeezrom is healed, when he's got this fever, it's raging and he wants healing. Alma, I think, is the one who offers that blessing. But Amulek is right there. And in that moment when Zeezrom, his words are probably the words that they heard the lawyers say to them in prison. Remember, it's Zeezrom that started this trend that started these ideas, planted these seeds in people's hearts, and then Alma and Amulek reaped the rewards of those seeds growing, this hatred and animosity. And I'm sure he heard Zeezrom's words as people were being thrown in the fire, or heard Zeezrom's words as they were being beaten in that prison cell. And so when Zeezrom comes and asks for healing and forgiveness, because Amulek has chosen to know, despite the hard, he can forgive. How else could you forgive in that moment? How else could you offer the healing that is requested by Zeezrom? He has the faith in Christ. He believes. And therefore, the priesthood should be accessible to him. And Alma and Amulek offer it. They freely forgive 
and they heal. And that is what comes from knowing rather than not knowing. Yes, you lose things. In this gospel of discipleship, we set down a lot. Some of it is stripped away from us, but what you gain is so much more. I love this message from Elder Holland. This is from his 2022 talk in October. He says, In every land and age, he has said to all of us, If any man or woman come unto me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This speaks of the crosses we bear rather than the ones we wear. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, one must sometimes carry a burden, your own or someone else's, and go where sacrifice is required and suffering is inevitable. A true Christian cannot follow the master only in those matters which he or she agrees. No, we follow him everywhere, including, if necessary, into arenas filled with tears and trouble, where sometimes we may stand very much alone. Later in the same talk, as the glorious resurrection followed the agonizing crucifixion, so blessings of every kind are poured out onto those who are willing, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob says, to believe in Christ and view his death and suffer his cross. Sometimes these blessings come soon, and sometimes they come later. But the marvelous conclusion to our personal Via Della Rosa is that the promise of the Master himself that they do and will come. I think that's what Alma and Amulek would testify of. That and Eve, and Adam, all of them would testify that it's worth it to know, to choose to know, rather than to live in that comfort of, you know, that, that comfortable place in Ammonihah, to know truth, and to be able to speak it clearly, and to be endowed with his power, is worth it. Because the blessings come. Whether they come in this life or the next, they will come. Prophets have promised it, and so I think we can rest on that and take up our cross with a little straighter back this week. Those sparks were a little longer than normal. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know how to cut that down. There's so much goodness in these chapters. Okay, now we're going to head into the questions part. I'll try and go through these a little bit faster. I've got three questions to just get you into your scriptures. Hopefully you'll get curious, you'll start having good conversations with people around you, and let me know what you find. My first question comes from Alma 14 verse 8. This is that horrific verse where you see women and children thrown into the flames. And not just the women and children, but the scriptures along with them, almost trying to like wipe out any sense of guilt that these people would feel. To me, it seemed really similar to when Pilate washes his hands. You know, it's that same feel, like they throw the scriptures in so they don't have to feel any guilt and they hope to get rid of all those emotions and it, it won't work. What is interesting to me is to see the parallels between this war tactic and what happens in our day. If you haven't heard, I was listening, as I was working on printables just yesterday, I listened to the Follow Him podcast, and they had Ava Weitzman on, and her commentary about these verses was so sharp. It was so articulate and compassionate. Oh, I would totally encourage you. I'll put a link in the notes so you can go find it. But I loved her connection. She talked about President Johnson and some of the words she has said about advancing the cause of women and children. And it was interesting to see that parallel. And then I saw a post on Instagram from Scripture Central that was focused on what President Johnson just released this week. So if you didn't see it on the church newsroom, I think it was on the 12th of June. This is when she talked about the initiative that the church is putting forward. There, I can't even remember the numbers, the amount of money that they're putting into these many different charities in order to aid the women and children of the world. This is a quote from that article. It says, global progress starts, this is President Johnson, by the way, global progress starts with nourishing children and strengthening women. When you bless a woman, you bless a family, a community, a nation. When you bless a child, you invest in the future. So my question is this, why is the war tactic of attacking the vulnerable, the women and the children, such an effective one? Why is that used? And then is the opposite true? If we care for mothers and children, can we actually change the world? I think there's something really interesting about seeing these two in tandem, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, second question. This comes from Alma 15, verse 18. This is after that trauma of Ammonihah. Alma and Amulek set up the church in Sidon, and then they heal Zeezrom, and then Alma checks the people, meaning like he sets rules in place. He reestablishes commandments. He gets the church in order. And then he takes Amulek into his own house. This is in the end of verse 18. He took him into his own house and did minister unto him in his tribulations and strengthened him in the Lord. I think all of us know that Amulek has been through some serious trauma. So has Alma. And my, my question to you is, what do you think this means? 
What do you think this phrase means? And are there parallels between this story and the story of the Good Samaritan or other miracles of Jesus? When Alma, this senior companion, this prophet, takes Amulek into his own home and he strengthens him in the Lord, what does that mean? And are there parallels with the New Testament that you can pull out? Okay, third question. This is Alma 16. This is around verses 4 through 8. It's just really interesting. I didn't have time to talk about it in the Sparks. But there's this cool story at the very end of this week's study where things are going better again, but the Lamanites attack and they take some of the people away. They're almost like hostages taken into the wilderness. And so this captain named Zoram, different Zoram than we've encountered in the past, but this captain named Zoram and his sons goes to the prophet. He goes to Alma and asks basically, how can we get those hostages back? And then Alma prays, seeks for guidance from the Lord, and he's able to tell Zoram exactly where to go in order to get the hostages back. And when he does, all of the hostages come back and they're unharmed. It's this miraculous story of deliverance. And here's my question. I think it's really interesting, well, I think it's interesting that Zoram comes to him with a question that's not a spiritual question. You know, he wasn't asking him to teach him doctrine or to help him understand something in the scriptures. He came asking him for a military tactic <laughs> and a war strategy. And I found myself wondering, like, do I do this enough? You know, am I turning to the prophet for things that could benefit my life in other ways? It almost reminded me of that talk I can't remember who gave it. When they were talking about the water bottle and how the prophet squished his water bottle in a certain way and so the other members of the First Presidency did the same thing and joked about following the prophet. I started to wonder if this is something I'm not tapping into enough. My question to you is, when have you seen other stories like this in Scripture? I think especially in the Old Testament, you see many stories like this where people turn to the prophet for not spiritual matters, but things that are help that they need physically. And my second follow-up question is, does this still happen today? Do people still turn to the prophet today for this kind of help? Even political leaders around the world, do they turn to the prophet for this kind of help? And does he offer it? I'm hoping if you have a good story and an example, I would love to hear about it. So either add it in the comments below or just talk to the people around you and let's talk about what prophets really offer, not just in scripture, but in our day as well. Before we head into the creative side of things, let me just leave you with one last little thought. One of my favorite batches of scripture I found, I stumbled upon as I was digging into the footnotes. It's right in that part when Alma and Amulek are at their low point in their story. And there's this link out to Psalms. So it's Psalm 69, 1 and 2, and then also verse 14. And it reads like this, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink deep, I, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of deep waters. There was something so haunting about those, that plaintive sound. You know, there he's out of choices and he's pleading for relief. What I like is I think each of us have these moments where we feel like you can't get your feet on the ground and the waters are rising and you are tired. You're tired of the fight. And I think Alma and Amulek had those moments. And my, my question was, how do you find rest in those moments when you just feel like the waters will not recede? And that's when this other verse came to mind. It's one of my very favorites from Joseph Smith's story. It's years after his Liberty Jail experience, when he's in another kind of prison. This is when he's in hiding. It's kind of self-imposed. He's, I think, in an attic, if I remember right. And he's offering these optimistic prayers and you know, writing out to the saints to let them know that he's okay, because he's in hiding from those who want to attack him and murder him. And there are these beautiful verses. And the one I love is DNC 127, verse 2. It says this, and I'm going to give you a portion of it because it's a long verse. It says, And as for the perils which I am called to pass through, they seem but a small thing to me. And then later, But nevertheless, deep water is what I am wont to swim in. It has all become second nature to me. And I feel like Paul to glory in tribulation. For, for to this day has God of my, the God of my fathers delivered me out of them all and will deliver me from henceforth. For behold, and lo, I shall triumph over all my enemies. For the Lord God hath spoken it. I think... This is rest. When you feel those moments where the water is coming up around you, you want to be at that point when Joseph was in this moment, years after Liberty Jail, when he realizes, oh no, I'm, I'm built for waters like this. I can swim. That same feeling I had in the race when I've been trained and I've done all the things 
and I know my muscles can make it. I feel like that's rest. Rest comes when you have the spiritual confidence that comes through not just covenant making, but covenant keeping. When you have, you realize you have the water around you and you have the strength to swim. As long as the Lord needs you to swim, you'll have the strength you need. That's what Joseph knew. And I think Alma knew it too. And my hope is that through better covenant keeping on my part, I can feel that strength, that confidence of knowing that I can keep going no matter how high that water feels. <music>